Well, we're continuing the series that we began several weeks ago that we have titled The King and His Kingdom. Now, we have learned that Satan has a kingdom. It's a kingdom of darkness, a kingdom of corruption, a kingdom of pain and suffering, death and destruction. God has a kingdom. God's kingdom is a kingdom, the Bible says, it's filled with righteousness, with peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The word kingdom, it can mean reign, it can mean authority, it can mean domain, dominion, but its primary meaning is the word government. Every kingdom has a way of doing things, has a government. And so God's way of doing things is entirely different from what the world system has to offer anyone under the auspices of Satan, the ruler of this world system. And so we've looked at several verses already, and I'm just going to review just two or three of these verses. Can't go back and look at all the verses we've looked at. But one of our major text scriptures is found from the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, verse 33. He said, but seek first. In other words, God is saying to us through His Son Jesus, this should be our priority in life. But seek first the kingdom of God, the government of God, the way God does things, the way God operates in this particular system. And his righteousness and all these things, the things that the heathen, the Gentiles are seeking after. Jesus said, when we make God's kingdom our priority, all these other things the world is seeking after will come into our lives. All these things shall be added to you. And the word seek in the original text, I've already given this to you, it means to look for. It means to strive to find with earnestness. That word means with seriousness, to be looking for, to strive with earnestness to find this kingdom and everything that is within this kingdom. Then the Apostle Paul wrote to us, and he said in Colossians 1.13, God, who hath delivered us from the authority, the power, the King James says, it's the authority of darkness, that's ruled over by Satan, and has translated us into the kingdom of God's dear Son. So we learned last week that God has turned over the authority of His kingdom to His Son, Jesus. And then finally, in Luke 17, 21, in the last part of the verse, Jesus said, For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. So when you experience the new birth, when you come into relationship with God, God by His Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence within you. His kingdom is within you. His government, His way of doing things, every need met, every desire met is in God's kingdom, which is within every believer. Now, God's kingdom, obviously, is not of this world. It is not of this world system, but God's kingdom works in this world. Why? Because that kingdom is inside you. Even though the kingdom is not of this world, it will work in this world because the kingdom is within you. Today, we're going to learn about principles that God gives to us in the Word of God. Because as we learned last week, God has a system, a way of doing everything. And from birth, through also the teaching that the world system gives us, in conjunction with our flesh, we've been taught how to live the world's way. That's common, because we're born into the world apart from God. And that's all we know, until we're born again. And then God wants to teach us about His way of doing things the way that God will cause your life to change when you get involved in seeking first His kingdom and learn that God has principles, laws, if you will, that He wants us to begin to, if you will, use so that we can access 
all the benefits that God has for our lives. David said to us in Psalm 103, beginning in verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all our iniquities, who heals all our diseases, who redeems us from destruction, who crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies our mouth with good things so that our youth might be renewed like the eagles. And so look what Jesus said to us in John 8, 31 and 32. Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, if you abide, live in my word, he said, you are my disciples Indeed, you're my enlightened ones. You're my students, is what the word disciple means. And he said in verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Notice he didn't say religion will make you free. He didn't say the more we embrace the system of this world, we will be made free. No, the systems of this world are designed to keep us in bondage, to keep us hurting, to keep us lacking. But Jesus said, when you know the truth, the truth will make you free. So knowing the truth from the Word of God family will show us how God's kingdom operates. It's a re-education system. We have to be re-educated. That's part of the purpose of the local church. That's the purpose, part of the purpose of men and women that God anoints to be in pulpits all around the world to teach people how to operate within his system. You need to be re-educated. And so truth, he's saying to us here, will set us free from the ravages that we encounter into this world. That the truth will set us free from the bondages of this world system. We all, at one time or another, get entangled with this world and this way of doing things. And all it does is bring pain and destruction into our lives. But truth from God's Word will set us free from all the entanglements of the world. Satan's job is to hold people into bondage by using the world system. Why? We learned last Sunday, all Satan cares about is controlling the earth, controlling all the resources in the earth. The same way that when God was delivering the Israelites from 430 years of Egyptian bondage, Pharaoh rose up. Pharaoh was a type of Satan. He represents Satan. And he rose up and he fought God's people. Why? Because he needed the Israelites to fulfill his plan in the earth. And so he fought Moses and the children of Israel. That's exactly what Satan does. Once you start becoming re-educated in the system of God's ways of doing things, Satan's going to fight you. Because he wants to control your life. Because if he can control your life, he will continue to control the resources in and around your life. He wants to rule the resources of this world. Look what David said to us in Psalms 82, beginning in verse 3. He's making a, a, a prayer of intercession for precious people. God loves people. See, see, Satan doesn't care about people. Again, he didn't care about the Israelites. He just wanted them to, to be used to fulfill his plan. It's all he wanted. He didn't care about people. God loves people. So he says in Psalm 82, 3, defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. See, the Bible says that God does nothing in the earth but what we ask him to do. Here we have a man interceding. For God to help the poor and the afflicted. He said, deliver the poor and the needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. He said, they know not. They know not. Neither will they understand. Why? Because they walk on in darkness. The world is covered in darkness. 
It's the opposite of God's kingdom, which is a kingdom of light. Listen to what he says in the last part of verse 5. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Church, the world system is based on a system that God did not build. God did not build this world system. Satan cannot invent or create anything. All he's done is taking the pattern of God's kingdom and he perverts it. He counterfeits it to keep people in check, to keep people in bondage. And this is what the enemy does. He can easily deceive and manipulate people because, number one, people don't have a relationship with God. So he can easily manipulate people. Or number two, if people are born again, Satan will do everything he can to keep us from the truth so that we have no revelation of God's kingdom. So that we'll have no revelation of how God operates within this system, which is opposite of this world system. Satan is behind a system that is controlling this world system by and large. Satan is behind a system that is controlling the entertainment of the world by and large. He's behind the system that's controlling most of the political systems in this world. He's behind the system that's controlling most of the economics of this world system. He's behind the system that is controlling man-made religions. Man-made religions have no power. Man-made religions have no authority, have no dominion, that has nothing to them but a bunch of dead rules and regulations that makes people feel better about themselves when they keep a rule or two. However, with God's kingdom inside of us, family, we can rule over every single system that Satan has established in this earth. Let's talk about some of these principles today. Very simple. You already know them, but I'm just going to define them very succinctly for you today. Jesus said to us in Matthew 6.30, Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Matthew 8.26. But Jesus said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Matthew 16, 8. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? When you see the Bible talking about God's hand, it represents what God does. God's hand can be moved. But there's only one way for a child of God to move God's hand. It's by faith. This is the very first pattern in God's way of doing things. It's the very first principle, rather, in God's pattern, His way of doing things. It's faith. God's kingdom, church, is designed to work by faith in Him. And then having the faith of God and operating in this faith. It all begins, number one, you have to have faith, we know, to be born again. I gave the altar call earlier today. I ministered some word. That word built faith in hearts of people to be born again. And so far, just in the uh, internet world, we've already had five people born again through our services in the two services, plus the ones who received Christ in the first two services, somewhere between five and ten people. Why? They heard the words. They heard the word. They heard the seed of God's word. It built faith to be born again. But once we are born again, we need faith to be able thereafter to receive from him, to move his hand. Now, I love this story. Most of you probably know this story. In 1 Kings chapter 17, God sent a prophet of God by the name of Elijah to a very wicked king by the name of Ahab. 
God didn't like what Ahab was doing. And so he sent Elijah to him to tell him from this moment forward until I say so, man, this is power. Until I say so, it's not going to rain. I mean, that's real power. And so famine in the land, God sent Elijah to the brook Cherith where he supernaturally sustained him with water and with ravens coming and feeding him twice a day with flesh and bread. Eventually, the brook dried up. And God spoke to Elijah and said, I have commanded a widow woman in Zarephath to sustain you. So let's pick up in verse 8, then uh, 1 Kings 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Now you need to understand something here. This widow woman was not an Israelite. She was a Gentile. She was a non-covenant woman. But when you read here, you have to infer that she had some type of relationship with God. Because God spoke to her. She recognized God's voice, obviously. So I don't know what kind of relationship she had, how long she'd had it, but she had something going on with God. So he arose, verse 10, he went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Isn't that just like a preacher putting his hand out wanting something? Come on, somebody. No, he's doing something greater than that. He's looking for seed. He's looking for seeds. Any preacher worth his being in a pulpit, understanding the kingdom of God, is trying to help people understand God's kingdom operates by seed. That we put faith in the seed of God's word. And so in verse 12, she said, As the Lord your God lives. Uh-oh. She's a little upset with God now. It's now your God. She says, I don't have bread, only a hand, handful of flour in a bin, a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in, prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. From the time God had spoken to her, she got to looking at the circumstances. She got to looking at the dire circumstances, the famine, all this death, all this destruction, and she got in fear. She got in fear. And when she got in fear, she got into reasoning. She got into thinking intellectually. And it motivated her to step out of faith and to go the world's way. But Elijah said to her, don't fear. Don't fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first. And bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. What he's saying here is, if you'll plant the right kind of seed, you will have the right kind of harvest, even with a little. Why? Because Zechariah 4.10 says, do not despise the day of small beginnings. Jesus said, if you had faith, even the size of a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all herb seeds, you can say to the sycamine tree, Be thou removed, and it will obey you. Despise not the day of small beginnings. Verse 14, For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up. I mean, this is faith speaking. Nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did, according to the word of Elijah, the man of God. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The margin of the Bible says for one whole year. One whole year. The bin of flour was not used up. Nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. The man of God told this widow Gentile woman to sow some seed. Had she chosen 
to disobey and disbelieve, she and her son would have died. You know why? This is the second principle you have to understand. If you were here Wednesday night, I taught this as well. God is not motivated by need. He's not. People look, even Christians, they look around the world and they hear about the suffering, the death, the mayhem, the starvation. And they say, how could there be a God? Pastor, you talk about God being love and loving the world. How could there be a God? And allow all this to happen. God allows it to happen because we allow it to happen. Because we do. Whatever you allow on the earth, Jesus said, will be allowed in heaven. We taught that a week or so ago. God's not motivated by need. He's not moved by need. And the more people think he's moved by need and the needs aren't met, the more angry people become with God. Because they have a misconception of who God is and how His kingdom operates because they think His kingdom operates like the kingdoms of the world. God's not motivated by need. God needs some seed that expresses our faith in Him. God needs faith coming from someone on this earth in order for God to work amongst us. This is how His kingdom operates. And it's not difficult. His kingdom operates by faith, sowing the right kind of seed. And here's the third principle that we all understand this. The third principle is that God is our source. Family, God wants to be the source for every need of our lives. That's, that's why in Genesis 14, when Abraham retrieved Lot and his family from being kidnapped. He took back all the spoils of victory. And the king of Sodom came to Abraham after he did that. And he said, uh, you, can keep the, you can keep all the goods, just give me the people. See, see, God doesn't, I mean, the enemy doesn't care about people unless he's using you for his purposes. That's all he cares about. He just wants to use it for his purposes. And Abraham said, no, 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 no. You're not going to be able to say that you made me rich. Only God made me rich. And this is why God doesn't want people becoming their own source and putting their faith in other man-made institutions because then we get proud about it. We become prideful thinking, look what I've done. Look how hard I've worked. Look at my blood, sweat, and tears. God doesn't want that. God wants to be the source for all of our needs. God does not want anything, any organization, or any person to be our source. In Ephesians 5, verses 30 and 30 through 32, the Apostle Paul wrote, For we are members of His body, of His flesh, flesh and of His bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. I love what he says here. He says, we are members of his body, that we are flesh of his flesh, we're bone of his bone. What is that saying? What does that intimate to you and me? That we are in an intimate relationship with God. Bone of His bone. Flesh of His flesh. We're one with Him. That's intimacy. That's oneness. Psalm 23, 1, David wrote and said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jesus so desperately wants to be the shepherd in our lives for every need every want. He wants to meet all of our needs so we lack for nothing, so we want for nothing. Jesus does not want you and me turning to any other shepherd in this world to sustain us or to meet our needs or to bring our desires into play. Let me show you something in the New Testament. It's kind of, it's kind of an eye-opener. It's an eye-opener when you read these verses in the New Testament where God is speaking 
to born-again Christians. In James 4, beginning in verse 4, James, who is a pastor, he's the half-brother of Jesus, he's a pastor. And he writes and says to Christians, he says, you're like unfaithful wives, having illicit love affairs with the world, and breaking your marriage vow to God. The Bible says we are a spouse to Christ. The Bible says He is the bridegroom. You and I are the bride of Christ. And He says here, Do you not know that being the world's friend is being God's enemy? So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world takes his stand as the enemy of God. Or do you suppose that the Scripture is speaking to no purpose that says the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, whom He has caused to dwell in us, yearns over us. That word yearn there means there's a passion within Him. There, there's this strong passion within Him to love us, to be our supplier of every need, to take care of us. He's inside of us. He yearns over us. And He yearns for the Spirit to be welcome with a jealous love. You know, the very first commandment in the Ten Commandments says, You shall have no other gods before me. Why? Because I'm a jealous God. But that's a good jealousy. You know, if tomorrow somebody called my wife early in the morning, a man calls my wife and says, Paulette, I'd like to take you to lunch today, and I want to take you to the mall, and I want to buy you a, a new suit of clothes. And she hangs up, and I'd say, who was that? Well, that was Mr. So-and-so. He wants to take me to lunch, and uh, he wants to take me to the mall to buy me a bunch of clothes. I'm going to go crazy. Okay? I'm going to go crazy because I'm her husband. I'm the man in her life other than the man Christ Jesus. I'm going to take care of her by the grace of God. I don't need another man doing my job. I'm going to be very, very jealous. I'm jealous for my wife. I don't want anybody moving in on my wife. If I can't take care of you, I'll get Junior to take care of him. He's big enough here. He'll take care of him. I'll get somebody. Amen. <laughs> I hope you got my point. <laughs> Verse 6. But He, God, gives us more and more grace. Power of the Holy Spirit to meet this evil tendency and all others fully. This evil tendency to become a friend with the world system. That's why God says that He sets Himself against the proud and the haughty, but He gives grace continually to the lowly, those who are humble enough to receive it. I'm telling you, church, God is a jealous God. But it's all for the right reasons. The Bible says He meets all of our needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The Bible says when we delight ourselves in the Lord, He will give us the desires of our heart. He wants to be the source for needs and desires. He wants to be the one that moves on the people to bring those needs into our lives because God moves through people. I mean, God doesn't counterfeit through heaven, coming to the earth, money or whatever. No, God uses people. But they're just people God's using. The source is God. The source is God. We're not to be in an intimate relationship with this world system. Jesus does not want the world system to take care of His bride. It brings a smile to His face when we release the seed of faith, trusting Him to meet all of our needs. Oh, He loves it. He loves it. And then the fourth and the last principle in learning how to access the benefits of God's kingdom is the principle of faithfulness. The principle of faithfulness. See, family, God's word is our seed that expresses our faith in him, that we only trust him, that he's the only one that can be trusted one 
of the time. Again, Satan has patterned his kingdom of darkness after the kingdom of God. You know, there was a time that you can read about in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, same account, where Satan came to Jesus after he had fasted and prayed for 40 days and nights. He tested him three different times. And one of those tests was, he took Jesus up on top of a mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of this world. Because he told Jesus, they have been delivered into my hand. Who delivered them into his hand? Adam. When Adam sinned, all the kingdoms that were in Adam's hands were now transferred to Satan. And so Satan said to Jesus, if you will just bow your knee to me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. And what did Jesus do? He used the word of God against him. He took the seed of God's word and he released his faith and told Satan to get behind him. To get behind him. That he was not going to allow Satan to bring these kingdoms into his life. Because ultimately, by Jesus going to the cross, all these kingdoms would one day come back to him. And so family, when people bow their knee to the enemy. As we learned last Sunday, yes, Satan can meet your needs by using the world system, but there's a problem with it. When we bow our knee to Satan and this world system to get our needs met, there's something always attached to it. It's called death and destruction. You've heard me teach this for 35 years. When we're young, primarily young, teenagers, Satan comes to us with the glitter of the world. He comes to us with the, the excitement of alcohol, tobacco, drugs, illicit sex, shoplifting, all these things, taking a certain pills to get us high. There's always an allurement. There's always something that kind of glitters, that kind of looks very, very exciting. But he never shows us the end from the beginning. He never shows us the detoxification that people go through. He never shows us the rehab that people go through. He never shows us the pain, the destruction, the AIDS, the STDs, the unwanted pregnancies. He never shows us these things. He just shows us the upfront excitement and glitter of what this world has to offer to meet needs, to get us high, to get us distracted from what life should be, to get us to medicate our pain. He never shows us. See, the same way you as a parent knows what's in the world that can ultimately harm your children, and you do a very good job from keeping your children from things that will bring harm into their lives. God knows Satan. And God knows the harm that Satan will use to bring harm into our lives. The book of Daniel is one of my favorite Old Testament books. It talks about Daniel. talks about the other three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And there came a time that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, made a decree that when certain Sounds went out that everyone had to turn and bow the knee to Nebuchadnezzar. And we pick up in Daniel 3.14. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who decided they're not going to do what the edict said for them to do. And he said, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I've set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, and by the way, make no mistake about it, Satan knows how to use music to get people into sin. Make no mistake. With all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made good. 
Again, Satan wants us bowing our knee and worshiping his system. Doesn't care about you. He just wants to control the resources of the world through you. He says, but if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? We can readily see from these verses that Satan uses the world system and those in it to get us to bow to him and carry out his plans. One of Satan's major tactics is to put pressure on you. And going back to the teen years, how do we get introduced to all these illicit substances and what have you? Peer pressure. Peer pressure. And dear children of God, you think the peer pressure is strong when you're a teen? It doesn't lighten up. It gets stronger into your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, all the way up. It never ceases to exist. He uses intimidation. He uses people to pressure you. He'll use people to bring shame or guilt into you to doing what the enemy wants you to do. It's exactly what took place here. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. In other words, we have someone bigger than you that we serve. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. There's faith. There's the seed of God's word. When we believe God and stay faithful in defying the world's pressures, God's system will start working for us. Verse 24, then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. He rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. I got news for us today. It was the Son of God. It was the Son of God. He shows up in the fire. He shows up when we take a stand. The Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. Y'all catch that? The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Family, when we learn to faithfully depend on God and God alone, He will supply our needs the same way God did for these three Hebrew young men. God will meet your need. God will take care of you. God will cause you to be protected. He will. And lastly, planting the seed of God's Word. So we express our faith in believing God by His Word. And the very first seed that we begin to plant for our need is the seed of God's Word. We have to begin to get God's Word on everything before God gets involved. Remember, God loves you. But God's not moved by your need. Now the Bible says that Jesus is easily touched by the feelings of your infirmities. Why? He went through the world. He went through pain. He suffered. So he's touched because he knows what you go through. He's touched by it. But he's not moved by the need. The first seed we have to plant for every need. Is God's Word. Because God's Word is what God's looking for coming out of our heart and out of our mouth. It's called faith. It's called faith. Jesus said to us in Mark 4, 14, the sower sows the Word. He said in verse 26, the kingdom of God 
is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Verse 27, and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. You know what Jesus is saying? You don't have to know all the details. You don't have to get into the weeds of everything. Just know that once we get the revelation from the Word of God and begin to release it, once you stand in faith and release that revelation out of your mouth, you know what God does? God goes into action. When you read Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 10, when he prayed two different prayers, when the angel finally got to Daniel both times, he said, the moment you prayed, I was sent to bring the answer to you. The second prayer in Daniel 10, he had demonic interference. It took him 21 days. But nonetheless, Daniel stood still. Daniel didn't give up. We should never give up. You have to remain faithful. Satan's job is to get us mired in the details so he can eventually get us into our thinking, into our intellect. And when you start getting into reasoning, that moves you out of faith. It moves you out of the realm of the Spirit. Verse 28 and 29 says, For the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the head. After that, the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle. Why? Because the harvest has come. The harvest will come. you got to stay faithful. you got to stay faithful. So, hey, come on. You can do this. You can do it. You have the good. You can do. You are people of faith. You can do this. Let's start working this system. Let's earnestly be seeking God's kingdom. The hidden system that is within us will produce for all of us if we will just follow God's principles. What happens in some of our lives, and I'm included in this, sometimes we just put up with stuff. We tolerate stuff. It's called low living. We can stop tolerating. And we can start overcoming anything through God's system by applying these principles. Our deliverance does not come from the outside church. Our deliverance comes from the inside of us, the Spirit. Lamentations 3.23 says that God is faithful. In fact, that verse says great is God's faithfulness. Let's plant seeds of faith. Let's stay steady. Even when the pressure comes against you, even though the enemy brings guilt and condemnation, let's recognize it for what it is. Recognize it for what it is. You've been taught in this church how Satan operates. Don't give in to him. Resist him. The Bible says, submit yourself therefore unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. One translation says that he will flee from you and start terror. Watch God as you stand in faith. As you stay faithful, watch God bring your harvest. Watch God bring the crop into your life, the fruit into your life. And then you know what you'll be able to do? Give him the glory. We won't give the world the glory. We won't take the glory. We'll give God all the glory. Would you give him praise today? Amen. Did you learn something today? You can do this. Say, I can do it. Say, I'm a man of faith. You're a woman. Say woman, of course. Let's do that again. Say, I am a...